Okay, so uh, I thank the organizers for inviting me. So I'll. Uh, so I, my, uh, I'm a mathematician. And my interest, one of my major interests, is in counting. So you might think, what's the big deal about counting? So let me show you that there's a lot of beauty and lots of interesting problems and uh, highly non-trivial techniques uh, in in a, in a uh, question in a mathematical question as simple as counting. So uh, mainly I'll focus on a class of counting problems which are related to tilings. So uh, those of you who are familiar with graph theory would have heard of perfect matchings, right? How many of you have heard of perfect matchings? Okay, so roughly what I'm going to talk about is counting perfect matching. So that's one way of thinking about it. So I'll, I'll uh, give you these. Uh, so most of the talk will just be pictures, and of course you should feel free to interrupt me and ask any questions. Uh, so I won't go too much into the theory. I'll just show you. Uh, I'll ask some questions and ask you uh, to think about how uh, things are calculated in starting with uh, simple examples on rectangles and then we'll go on to counting problems on hexag uh, actually I'll first do aztec diamonds and then I'll go on to hexagons and then we'll talk a little bit about random tilings okay so uh, this is all topic of current research so there's lots of so it's not just some kind of uh, thing that four people in the world do, it's it's sort of, uh, of, of broader interest. And uh, towards the end, I'll, I'll explain some main ideas, the main ideas involved. I won't get too much into it, you can ask me later. If you like. So here's a tiling problem. Here is this uh, random shaped surface, you know, some, some polygon. And here are these pieces and I give you this question, uh, can you tile this? So you, you have all seen jigsaw puzzles, I suppose. So this is an analog of a jigsaw puzzle. Here are these seven pieces. Please tile this figure with this. Okay. So this is certainly a question anybody can ask, and this might be like a jigsaw puzzle. This is a recreational problem. Here is the solution. But the question is, why is this not an interesting problem? I mean, somebody gave you some some figure, cut it up in some way, and asked you to assemble it. That I claim is not an interesting problem, mathematically. You know, someone can sit down, it could be very difficult to solve this. I'm not saying this is necessarily a trivial problem, but this is not interesting because there is no theory behind it. There's no structure. There's nothing that we understand about general problems by looking at one particular funny looking polygon. So uh, let me just introduce some general notions. So uh, yes, is there a question? Yes. So a tiling problem in general will give us a region just like before and a set of tiles. And you are asked to cover the region using these tiles. I mean, depending on the problem, you have these fixed number of tiles or you can use them with repetition. And usually you, you can move the tiles, you can translate them, you can rotate them, but you cannot reflect them. You cannot cut them up, right? So this, this is the, these are the parameters. Uh, so the underlying tiles are fixed, you can rotate them at most, but uh, nothing else and you want to fill the space completely that you are given. So what are the questions that you might ask? The first thing you might ask is does a tiling exist? So I will give you examples very soon. So, so now the first question is does a tiling exist? Now if, it, if there is such a tiling, how many are there? So what is counting the number of tilings? And if it is very difficult to say exactly how many are there, can we roughly say, can we give an approximate answer? So typically we will be interested in families of graphs or families of uh, domains. So with, which, which increase with size, area if you like. And there is usually an integer parameter n. So as n goes to infinity, roughly how big is it? That is the kind of question one would like to ask. Can you construct an explicit example? Sometimes these things can be very hard. Another problem that is of interest is to generate tilings, to generate for example random tilings. So, so if you are given one tiling, can you perform local moves and get all tilings that way? That is another question. Then you can ask more refined questions. Are there tilings with special symmetries? And okay, so the last one I have already stressed. So let's start with one problem. So 
So, okay, if you have extra chocolates, maybe you can give this. Here is the problem I ask you to solve right now. Suppose I take a chessboard and I remove the opposite corners. So, it is a you everybody knows what a chessboard is, it is an 8 by 8 uh, square consisting of unit squares. I remove the opposite corners and I want to tile them with what are, what are called dominoes. So, a domino is a set of two adjacent unit squares. So, it is a 1 by 2 or a 2 by 1 uh, rectangle. Yeah, so these are the dominoes. Now, I want you to tell me, maybe let us, I will give you 2 minutes and whoever does it gets a prize. How many tilings are there of this? Yes? None. Very good. How? Exactly. So, the hint to this problem is that a chessboard is not a proper chessboard until it has it is colored properly. So, you are absolutely right. You cannot see this here, but uh, on here I can see that it is black and white. So, as you rightly observed, so maybe let us just count it. So, suppose this cell is black, then this would be white, black, white, black, white, black, white. So, this would be white, but then if you continue this way, you will find that this is black. So, as she said, every domino necessarily involves one white cell and one black cell, right. But I have removed two black cells from a from a configuration which had a same number of even black, I mean white and black cells. So, no matter how you tile, you will end up at the end with two white cells, right. And two white cells cannot be tiled by them. So, this is an example of what is called a coloring argument. So, there are more refined questions. So, so, the answer is 0 and uh, I mean of course, the answer had to be 0 because otherwise I cannot expect you to, I mean it is not human, I mean I would not be a very nice guy if I asked you to come up with some huge number in 2 minutes, right. So, so the answer is that it is 0, right. So, this is an example of a coloring argument and such arguments are helpful in showing that no tiling exists, okay. So, let us go to rectangles. So, of course, I am not going to ask you this as a prize question, this is too easy. So, you have a 1 by n rectangle. So, this is n equals 5. How many tilings are there of this with dominoes again? 0 because this is an odd number, right. Each tiling takes care of 2 cells. So, there is an odd number here. And in what if I had even, what would the answer be? 2, why? n by 2, that is a lot of tilings, okay. Is there a board? No. You have to tile it with dominoes, remember. Can you guys see this? Is there a light here? Ah, good idea. Ah, there. So, let us do the case for n equals 6 maybe, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So, what can you do? You want to tile it with dominoes, but there is really no choice. The first, this guy has to be occupied by domino. What can it do? It can take these two. Then, well, you can just say induction at this point, but okay, let us complete the story. Then you do this and then you are stuck with this. So, there is exactly one tiling, yeah. So, if n is, so this is the answer to this question. So, if n is even, there is exactly one tiling and if and is odd, there is no time. But now, so this argument shows that if I want to tile an m by n rectangle, at least one of them must be even because the product of two odd numbers is odd and so one of them must be even. So, let, let me take an even simpler case for where both m and n are even. So, now I am looking at 2 m by 2 n rectangles, okay. Now, this is a hard question. How many tilings are there? I have not removed any diagonal or any, I have not done any such trick. So, I want to know how many there are. So, this question which I call f 2 m 2 n, the number of such tilings is of interest to physicists because this is related to something called uh, the problem of adsorption, but let me not get into it. So, so people, physicists have been interested in this question for a very long time. 
since the early 20s you can find references actually. And amazingly in the same year 1961, two different groups found the exact answer to the number of domino tilings of the m by n, 2 m by 2 n grid actually the more general problem and amazingly it is given by this double product formula. So, f of 2 m 2 n is 4 raised to the power m n times this product over j n k of cos squared of j pi by 2 m plus 1 plus cos squared k pi by 2 m plus 1. I want you to notice how awesome this formula is. Cosine squares of uh, such uh, quantities are irrational numbers. They are not only not integers, they are not even rational, they are irrational numbers, okay. So, what this is saying is that I take the sum of these two irrational numbers, I take a product of all of these guys and miraculously I not only get a rational number, I actually get a positive integer and that and it is not just any random integer, it is the integer which is which is an answer to a counting problem, okay. So, this is I mean if you think about it a little, this is like a mind boggling answer because there is no way anybody could have guessed that this is the answer to this problem, right. So, as I said it is not even clear that this is a rational. So, for m equals 3 and n equals 2 this looks like this. So, I have 4 to the 6 and I take these cosine squares. There is no simple expression by the way for cos pi by phi and cos pi by 7 and so on. They are square roots of square roots and things like that, complicated expressions. Uh, of course, heavily irrational. So, you take 4, four to 4 raised to the power 6 is 2 to the 12 which is 4096 and then you have all these factors. These are all horrible irrational numbers and if you multiply all them out, you get exactly 281 which is the number of times. So, it is really awesome formula. Okay, so, let me get into another th thing which I will talk about later. Yes, excuse me, do you have a question? Uh, you are very loud, I can hear you all the way here. Okay, so, I will talk about this later, but here is uh, what is what what is uh, a random tiling. So, maybe I would not get too much into it. Uh, you, you guys have had lectures in probability, right. So, uh, so you know what the uniform distribution is, right. So, if I give you the numbers or if I give you finitely many objects, the uniform distribution is one where each object has probability one by the total number. So, here is a uniformly chosen random tiling from the set of all tilings of this 40 by 40 grid, okay. So, it is this is how it looks like and the main thing I want you to notice is that there is nothing particular going on here. In particular, if I look locally over here, this sort of looks locally like this and like this and like this. There is no special structure anywhere here, right. So, in other words, this is like Sherlock Holmes kind of thing, you know, what you want to notice is that there is nothing particular to notice, okay. And we will see some other examples where there is something to notice, okay. So, I will I'll remind you of this. So, another question that I had uh, pointed out early on was uh, how to get all tilings. Suppose you have one tiling, can you sort of do local moves and get all tilings? So, let me illustrate this here. So, so, here is the 2 by 4, this this works for all m and n, provably so. So, for m equals 2, n equals 4, let us take this tiling which is just horizontal dominoes, yeah. So, now I claim that if I make these moves which interchange horizontal two adjacent pairs of horizontal dominoes and just rotates them by 90 degrees to get two adjacent pair of vertical dominoes, that local move is enough to get all of them. Why? So, let us see here. So, we start with this fellow. I interchange the bottom two, I mean I do it on the bottom two, I get this. I do it on the middle two, I get this. I do it on the top two, I get this. And for example, I can do it, interchange the other two and I get this and there are exactly five, okay. There is, there is no more. And the theorem that has been proved, uh, I think by Randall, 
A and, and collaborators is that this thing is possible even here. And for any 2m by 2n, for example, okay. So, you take the all horizontal domino tiling and you can do local moves and get any tile. Of course, it may take an enormously long time to get it, right, because you are you are doing only one shift at a time and you have to change to get this, for example, God knows how many billion moves you would have to do, okay. So, it is not, a, I mean, but mathematically it has been shown that you can do it, okay. So, so, here also okay. So, for m equals n equals 4 also you can check that one can get from any time. Yeah, okay, I will not do that. Okay, so as I as I stressed before this formula f of 2 m 2 n is a is a very elegant and very beautiful formula, but it does not give tell us how many there are. I mean it does not give us any intuition for how how, how many there are and um, generally uh, one expects uh, so that this will be exponential in the number of cells. So it will be some constant raised to the number of cells in a uh, in this. M so let me take m equals n for simplicity. So this quantity that we want is two n two n, and uh, this thing grows exponentially with the number of cells. So it's exponential, some constant raised to the power. 4 n squared that is the area if you like and again using that beautiful formula you can show that this constant is exactly given by e to the g over pi where g is this alternating sum of reciprocal squares of odd numbers. So, this is this is a well known numerical constant discovered long ago it is called Catalan's constant okay. So, it is a it is an infinite series but it is summable. And this number is not known to be related to pi or e or any of the other constants. Okay, so it's another. It's one of these other fundamental constants. So one says in whenever you get a formula like this that you have a degree of freedom per square of c, because it's like you're multiplying c four four n squared times. So associated to each square, you have how many ways are there of tiling in question in quotes. The number of ways of tiling is 1.3385 roughly for a rectangle. For each square, so I am saying something slightly non trivial, but philosophical. I am saying that to each cell or each square, you have the degree of freedom is this number 1.33. This is how one interprets this kind of calculation, okay. So, how you give physical meaning to this. Okay, so let me go to another class of uh, structures which are again very nice. So, these are called Aztec diamonds. So, these are related to some structures which people discovered in the Aztec culture long time ago. So, what you do is you, is the pattern clear? Should I explain it? So, you take this uh, staircase shape let us do this example 3. You take the staircase shape, you put 3, 2, 1, right. So, you get a, a staircase and then you reflect it both horizontally and vertically. So, you get 4 copies of it, yeah. So, that structure is called an Aztec diamond, okay. Is it clear? Please ask me if it is, if anything is not clear. So, again, we are going to tile by dominoes. So, first question, maybe not a price question, how many domino tilings are there of? Z1, 2, right, both horizontal or both vertical, okay. Now, it comes the price question, how many are there for Z of 2? 2 minutes, it is not a very large number. One? Oh, no. Eight is right. So, who said 8 first? You said 8, okay, very good. So, so let me show you. So, of course, 2. So, here are the 8 tilings of uh, of AZ2, okay. So, all horizontal again works, but if all horizontal works, this figure is symmetric about a 90 degree rotation, all vertical also has to work, right. And in between there are some things. 
And again, here you can do the same moves that I said earlier to get from anything to anything. So, for example, from here to here you can flip these two and similarly there, but then you can also check that, I mean this time the moves are going to be a little more complicated, but you can get from the all horizontal to all vertical. So, it is a good exercise, I challenge you to do it. Okay. So, now one more price question is going to come up, so be ready, fingers on the button, okay. So, here are the domino tilings, people did it on a computer, people sat down and calculated all the domino tilings. For AZ1236, there is this, these are the numbers. So, you tell me the pattern and I want the exact answer and please be aware that if you give something which is approximate, you are hinting to others. What the right? Yes. That is not an answer. I want an answer for n. That is why I said be careful before stating. Wrong. That is wrong. No. Well, at least everybody seems to have realized that it is a power of 2, that is that's very good, that is that's a good start and yes, it is right, it is a power of 2. So, what is the power of 2 over here? 1, then, then, so that fails the 3, okay, that is okay. What is this? 10. But 10 is not a multiple of 3. So, some people who says 3 times something is wrong. Just tell me the answer. Wrong. 2n plus 2 is an even number by definition. And this is 2 raised to power 3. Ah, so close. You are very close. Think again. Well, I heard the right answer from there. Yeah, so it is 2 power n into n plus 1 by 2. Yeah, but I think he he he's the first one who got the quadratic. So, he, he yeah, raise your hand. Yeah, that is right. So, the numbers 1, 3, 6 and so on are called triangular numbers. So, 1, 3, 6, 10, etc. are triangular numbers and they are given by n choose 2 typically. They are called triangular because they are sums. 3 is 1 plus 2, 6 is 1 plus 2 plus 3, 10 is 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, so Okay, so as I said, this is exactly 2 to the n into n plus 1 by 2. Very good. So, again, all your, uh, all the, uh, many of your answers were 2 to the sum linear term in n, but you see that cannot be possible, well, not, not really, but uh, given that I am asking you a non-trivial question, it cannot be, because this is a two-dimensional, uh, these Aztec diamonds are two-dimensional objects. So, they have, you know, quadratically many cells. So, it will be some c to the power of quadratic number. Right? So, that is the intuition that one has, okay. Right. So, again let us calculate this quantity C, here it is very easy to calculate because we, we have an explicit answer. I, I, by the way, I should stress that it is a highly, highly non-trivial fact that these are all powers of 2. There is no simple proof of this known and you can try if you like, you, I mean if you figure out, I mean that is certainly a publishable paper. I mean there is there is really no simple formula. And why should it be a power of 2 is also not clear, I mean. So, uh, so yeah, so I mean this, these are deep theorems. Okay, so let us calculate C for this. So, the total number of squares you can calculate is this number 2, 2 n times n plus 1, okay. And so, since we know that the, so our degree of freedom is c, so c raised to power 2 n plus 1 is this number. So, c is the 
square root of the square root of 2 is approximately 1.189 and remember that the number for the square was 1 point roughly 1.33. So, in some sense what we are saying because 1.33 is greater than 1.189 is that the square is the 2 n by 2 n square is easier to tile. There is more degree of freedom associated to a single cell in an n 2 n by 2 n squared than it is in an asterisk diamond of size n ok. That is what this means that is why this being greater than this has some meaning. So, in other words if you if you drop dominoes randomly on the 2 n by 2 n cell it is very likely that you are going to be able to complete it. But if you do that with the, with the asterisk diamond it is less likely that you are going to be able to complete it ok. This is the intuition. So, here is what a random tiling of a large Aztec diamond looks like ok. So, again uniformly random I took this huge list of uh, tilings I picked one uniformly at random and this is what I got ok. Remember now what I said about the 40 by 40 square does this part look the same as this part absolutely not this thing is very well ordered these are all horizontal dominoes they are all vertical all horizontal all vertical and here it is a mess right. And roughly the mess here is the same as the mess was in the 40 by 40 square there it was not colored. So, maybe it is less easy to see, but it was of the same order of magnitude the mess was of the same order ok. How much time do I have till 3 30 ok good. Well okay. So, here in fact there is more to say about a random tiling than what we said earlier and I am going to stress on this now. So, this is called the arctic circle phenomenon. So, so that is what I said. So, I am looking at a typical tiling. So, what is a typical tiling? It is a uniformly random tiling ok. Now, for certain class of tilings like the Aztec diamond the answer becomes surprisingly less and less random as you go larger and larger ok. So, in this example what is happening as you make the system larger and larger and you sort of compress it so that you can see inside this uh, presentation or this uh, slide is that there is this quadrant over here this some part of this quadrant which will become frozen with probability 1 this guy will be like this even though it need not be so. You remember the all vertical tiling is a valid tiling and the all horizontal tiling is a valid tiling. So, in it is not necessary that this guy should the first topmost guy should be a horizontal domino, but with probability 1 as n goes to infinity this guy will be a horizontal domino that is what I am saying. I am saying something quite remarkable ok it, it turns out to be the case and similarly here for vertical and so on. So, there will be three regions one is what is called a frozen region. So, there is the terminology for this is borrowed from the earth's uh, earth's climate climatology. So, there is an arctic region which is frozen like the tundra right. So, ice or whatever. So, this is the frozen region these things are frozen this is what I meant by saying this with that with probability 1 these guys will be fixed as shown here in these four corners there will be the center which is called uh, the temperate region or whatever the tropical region. And there is a curve that is going to separate them these two regions which is known as the arctic circle. Okay, so, again the terminology comes from the earth's climate ok. So, so this is what I said there is a disordered region. So, there is also an analogy uh, to the uh, phases of matter. So, the frozen region is like a crystal everything is set right. So, that is so, it is called a solid phase the the region in the center is highly disordered you know you cannot get any structure it is like the square. So, it is called the gaseous phase highly irregular and there is a liquid phase that separates this is another very evocative terminology that one can use. 
and uh, this is called uh, so th this is the rough classification of what happens for a large random asterisk diamond tiling of the asterisk diamond. So, as I said, these things are of current interest. So, for example, just to illustrate that to you, Andrei Okunkov won the Fields Medal in 2006 for studying things related to this, actually, more related to the hexagons, which I am going to come to. Okay. Yes. So, what you are saying is that if I take a really big asterisk diamond mm -hmm. and I try to tile it, then almost to the probability. No, 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 no. We are not talking about trying to tile. I am saying you list all. Uh, so, in principle, what you want to do is you want to list all of these tilings and pick one uniformly at random. it will have this structure right and this structure will get better and better refined as you increase the size for uh, 2 or, or whatever for 6 or something it won't look as nice but these things will get more and more pronounced this demarcation will get more and more pronounced as you increase the size so the larger it is the better it is for you okay now there is another question of how to sample for these things. Have you heard about sampling in this? So, maybe you have heard about that sampling is an important question and so on. So, how to sample? So, there are very efficient ways of sampling. So, for even an asterisk diamond of size a million or something, you know, you can sample very efficiently. Okay. But of, of course, you know, you do not need to because the theorems are already proved. Okay. I mean, you might need to for other reasons. Okay, so as I was saying, so Okunko won, won the Fields Medal for uh, you know explaining some of these results. So there are deep connections between these results that I'll, especially on hexagons, which I'll talk about, and uh, question deep mathematical questions in very abstract mathematics related to algebraic geometry and representation theory. Okay, so I'm not going to talk about it. It's just to mention that these these things are non-trivial and interesting. So, this is how this thing is going to look like. So, in general, the octic curve is going to be some curve for uh, for different for different uh, for these hexagons you will see, but for the asterisk diamond it is actually exactly a circle. Okay. So, if you if you sort of could see before I even said something if you could see a roughly circular shape here it is not a coincidence it is exactly a circle. Okay, so let me get to uh, tilings of hexagons. So I'm going to sort of switch topics now, and we are going to go away from domino tilings. We are going to go into something called lozenge tilings. But uh, are there any questions about domino tilings? You can ask me later if you like. Okay. Okay. So uh, let so a quick digression. So uh, have you guys heard of partitions before? Okay. So if you take a positive integer n. You can write it as in terms of smaller representatives, right? So that the sum, some of these guys. So a partition lambda is a is a is a list, if you like, lambda one, lambda two, up to lambda k, such that they sum up to a given an integer n. So for example, if I take n equals five, it has several partitions: four, one, three, two, three, one, one, etc. All of these are partitions of five. Yeah, so this is uh, this sort of well known, and uh, by convention we are, we are going to order them in weekly decreasing order, so non increasing order. So so they're going to be uh, going downwards. Okay. So so let me just mention, if you don't know, so one of the greatest achievements of uh, Ramanujan was to find the exact number of partitions of n for large n and this is called known as the Hadi Ramanujan formula. It is really a remarkable formula which tells you okay. So, just to stress how remarkable the formula is, suppose you wanted the number of partitions of I do not know 500, then it will be like a few trillion or a quadrillion or something. So, in a number that large, it is okay for your formula to be wrong by a million. Because a million as a percentage of a quadrillion is what 0.0001 percent or something, right? It is a very, very small error. So, a formula which gives you a good answer which is off by something like a million to a number which is like a quadrillion is acceptable, it is perfectly justified. But the Hardy, Hardy Ramanujan formula is correct to within 1 for any integer, 
okay. So, if the answer is 4031276, the answer will be 4031275.7, okay. The error is within 1, okay. So, it is an extremely beautiful piece of mathematics and uh, so that is, uh, so the formula is about the number of partitions. So, it is just an aside. Okay, so now let us get to tilings. So, one can represent a partition using something called a Young diagram. So, a Young diagram, so you remember the partition is written this way lambda 1 up to lambda k. So, you place in the kth row, you play, place lambda k boxes which are left justified, okay. So, that is a partition. So, for example, this is too small to see, but this is the partition 4, 3, 3, 3, 1 and this is the partition 3, 3 for example, yeah? all of these are valid partitions, okay. So, it being a partition means that uh, the rightmost line uh, goes you know down and left and never goes right for example. So, okay, so now plain partitions, one level of uh, increase the number of dif uh, level of difficulty plane partitions are 3 D analogs of partitions. So, one way of thinking about it is to uh, so take that corner over there, place boxes so that you push them as far in as possible, okay. Another way of thinking about it is you just rotate this room uh, by 45 degrees so that the corner is at the bottom and gravity is of course downward. So, all the boxes, so it will never happen that there will be a box in suspension or in an unstable location, right. The boxes will all be pushed downwards by gravity. So, this is an example of a plane partition. One can make it rigorous and it will just take too much time. I hope the intuition is clear, yeah, okay. So, so just like I told you about the Hadi Ramanujan formula, one can ask questions about the number of plane partitions of n. So, what is n here? The total number of boxes. So, the Young diagram is a 2D version. Right. So, the total number of boxes is n, right. So, here the total number of boxes also, all right. So, if you want to ask the number of plane partitions of n, you know that is that is okay, that is another question, but there there is a question related to this which is which has connections to tiling. So, that is what I am going to describe now. So, here is a piece of what is called the triangular lattice. So, what you do is you take parallel vertical lines, 60 degree lines and 120 degree lines, okay. And this, the spacing should all be the same so that you form hexagons, right. So, so like this, okay. So, I hope it is clear. So, it only the unit cells are two kinds of triangles facing leftward and facing rightward, yeah, okay. So, these are, uh, so this is, this is the analog of the square that we are going to tile. Now, I am going to tell you what I am going to tile it with, okay. So, you are going to tile it with these three lozenges. So, what is a lozenge? A lozenge just like a domino is a pair of adjacent cells, but now there can be three types. So, let us go here. So, let me stress. So, there is this type, you see this, these two adjacent cells, you see that is like this. Then there is this, right, these two at this angle at 120 degree angle and there is this which is at a, like this at a 60 degree angle, right. You see this, everybody sees this. So, there are three kinds of basic tiles. So, these are called lozenges. So, each one of these are rhombi, right, rhombus, um, plural of rhombus. So, here is a 3 by 3 by 2 hexagon okay and I want to tile it with these three fellows. Here is one example of a tiling. Now, here is where your brain messes with you. This is really a two dimensional tiling, but because of our you because the brain interprets it as uh, what is it called, um, sorry, this picture is where you have uh, perspective, thank you. So, it, it interprets it as a perspective. So, for example, you can, you think that there are two boxes here like that and you think that there is one box here and you think there is no box here, right. 
and you can also see it the other way around. I mean, there are two dual ways of seeing this, right? Okay, so this is the connection between plane partitions and tiling. So plane partitions is the wrong way to think about it. You should think about it as a tiling of a hexagonal region. Okay, so here is all the tilings. So of a two by two by room, if you like, or or a two by two by two hexagon, if you like, they're equivalent. So so this is the empty room. There are no boxes from one point of view, but from another point of view, these these four are one kind of tile, these two four are another and these four are the other, right. So they are shaded, there are three shadings, each shading corresponds to a particular kind of lozenge, okay. So this is one tiling or, this, or if you like this is one way of filling a room by doing nothing. This is that corresponding tiling. You can ignore this. There's a lattice path interpretation. Okay, we don't get into it. This is with one box. These are with two boxes. These are with three boxes. These are with four boxes. These are five, six, seven, and full. Yeah, each one of them is a lozenge tiling. Okay. So the question we are asking is, how many lozenge tilings are there of the n by n by n hexagon? Okay, that's the question we are interested in. That is another way of saying how many plane partitions are there in an n by n by n box. All possible plane partitions inside an n by n box. You include the empty partition, you include the one with one, two, etc. All the way. So here again there is a beautiful formula and this is due to Percy McMahon, Major McMahon who was a army lieutenant and he was posted in India actually uh, in this time. He went back to England after his duty and then he decided he wanted to do mathematics. So he he started this business of partitions and plane partitions studying them more systematically. So he found that the number of plane partitions in an A by B by C box is given by this amazing product formula. You take the product of I going from 1 to A, J going from 1 to B, K going from 1 to C, I plus J plus K minus 1 divided by I plus J plus K minus Again, it's not obvious. That, well, of course, it's a rational number, but it's, but it's not obvious that this is an integer. And it is an integer. Okay. So, again, uh, so it's very old. So this is in the early 1920s, I think. Okay. So, so this has this also has modern applications. So before I get to that, so here you, in the beginning, I had mentioned that one also studies. Uh, tilings under certain symmetries. So these lozenge tilings have a lot of symmetry, some of them. So you can you can fix that you only want to study, you only want to study tilings which are symmetric about reflection about any of the three axes. That's one. You can also study which are uh, rotation symmetric. So maybe let's let's look at these examples. So here is a tiling which is symmetric about vertical reflection, right? So if you Take reflect this tiling about this axis, you find the same tiling. You can look at this if you like. Same for this, yeah. Uh, and there are rotation symmetric also, and where the hell is that? So this is rotation symmetric. Okay. Actually, this is rotation symmetric. If you rotate it, you get by 120 degrees, you get the same tiling. So is this. Okay. There is one more symmetry which is called complementation. So the complementation symmetry is the following. You this is like particle hole symmetry. So you flip the whole thing this way and replace all the boxes by emptiness and make the empty things boxes. And if you get the same thing as what you started out with, this is called symmetric about complementation. So in this case, there is only one tiling that is self complementary and that is this one. It has four boxes. If you just visualize what are the what is the location of the empty emptiness, and you turn it upside down, I mean turn it uh, not upside down, but reflect it about the one 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 coordinate, uh, you'll get the same thing. So there are nice formulas for those two. Okay, so I'm not telling you all that. I mean, uh, I'm already sort of running short of time. Okay, so here's a large random lozenge type. 
Sound familiar? You again see there is some frozen regions here, right? So this has the same flavor as the Aztec diamonds and that is what, so these are things that Okunkov I mentioned worked on. I will mention, I will give you one more example in a second. So here also there is a, a solid phase, a gaseous phase, a frozen region and a disordered phase region and there is an arctic curve which separates the two and here it might be less obvious but in fact again this is a circle. This turns out to be a circle, okay. So, so Okunkov's work was of course not on just n by n by hexagons or a by b by c hexagons or something, it was much more general, it was a very general theory. Just to give you one illustration, even so I do not know if you can see but there is actually an underlying, so this is part of the hexagonal grid, the triangular lattice and this is actually a random tiling of this kind of funny structure. And in fact there is an arctic curve here which looks like a heart shape, you see it is like that. So it has a pinch point, it has a cusp, okay, somewhere over here. And all these are frozen regions over here, over here, over here, here, even this part. Yeah. So, so there is a very general theory now for explaining this, you can calculate the curve explicitly given the shape and all that and so large part of that due to Okunko and his collaborator. Alright, so maybe in the last few minutes, I just tell you how does one do this calculation. So I just presented all these pictures and those of you who are mathematically inclined might be wondering how the hell does one do these calculations. How did you get all these beautiful formulas? You know, nobody, I mean it was not given as a gift from up there, no. So someone did it. So what is the idea? So let me just mention the main idea and I will stop. So this includes ingredients from linear, alge linear algebra and I know that Professor Krishnapur has given you a two hour lecture on linear algebra. So you know what a determinant is. He has assured me that he has told you what a determinant is. So we just need to know what a determinant is. So suppose M is an n by n matrix, then this is the formula for the determinant. The important thing for me is that it is a sum over permutations. And for each permutation there is a sign and you take the i, if sigma is a permutation you take the product over entries i comma sigma i, right, this is the determinant. Now the, uh, it is useful to think of a permutation in terms of its cycle structure. So a permutation is a bijection from the set 1 through n to itself. So you can write it in one line notation like this, which means 1 goes to 4, 2 goes to 6, 3 goes to 1, etc., right. But you can also think about it in cycle notation. So cycle, this means that 1 goes to 4, 4 goes to 3, 3 goes to 1, which is the case here and 2 goes to 6 and 6 goes to 2, etc. and 7 goes to itself, for example. Singletons in the cycle decomposition are fixed points, right, so they do not change. So in particular, I can group these sum ends in this way. So for example, for this particular permutation that I have in for n equals 9, I have this sign and I have m14, m43, m31, m26, m62, etc. So I can group it this way, right. So if I look at the entries, so I am like going in some, I am grouping them according to in some way, right, uh, according to the cycle structure. So the key idea in this business is to superpose, so let us look at domino tilings, this story is the same is to superimpose two domino tilings. This is really the key ingenious idea. So here I have drawn this again, what is it, 5 by 4 grid and I have drawn a domino tiling by a line, so uh, by the dual graph if you like. So this vertical line, uh, solid line means I have put a domino on these two cells, okay. So on one, on one I have taken the vertical thing, vertical dominoes, I have tiled it completely by vertical dominoes. In the other case I have done something more non-trivial. But when I superimpose two domino tilings, this is the key idea, I get a super, uh, I get a bunch of cycles. So this will be, this is one cycle, this is one cycle. I also get 
in case I choose the same domino from both I get the same cycle. So, I have drawn it that way. So, so a superposition can be decomposed into a bunch of disjoint cycles that is the key idea. And now based on what I said about the determinant this should help you do something. The other ingredient from linear algebra I need is the following theorem of Cayley. If I have a skew symmetric does everybody know what a skew symmetric matrix is? It is a matrix which when you take its transpose is minus of itself yeah. So, that is called a skew or anti symmetric matrix. If I take a skew symmetric even matrix square matrix 2 n by 2 n then its determinant is always a perfect square ok. This is an old theorem of Cayley and the Fafian of a of a skew symmetric even matrix is the is the positive square root is just this is you can just take this as a definition ok. So, in one case I superpose two domino tilings. So, so as I said earlier we want the number of perfect. So, if I now frame this graph theoretically I have a graph G with an even number of vertices. I need even vertices because otherwise I would not be able to do a domino tiling right each or, or a perfect matching because each matching involves two vertices yeah. So, I need even. So, the number of perfect matchings. So, suppose M is a skew symmetric version of the adjacency matrix of M of G. Then each term in the determinant of the adjacency matrix is going to be a product like this. Each such term is going to be related to a to a cycle in this superposition that is the key idea ok. So, I have shoved a lot of things under the carpet. So, I do not expect you to get it fully, but the rough idea I hope is clear. So, for example, G is the 4 cycle then the adjacency matrix of the 4 cycle I mean if this were all 1s that would be the adjacency matrix of the 4 cycle, but I make a skew symmetric version. So, I make it by you know arbitrarily putting some signs to be negative. So, in this case I chose everything below the diagonal to be minus 1, here I chose you know one of these guys to be minus 1 the others to be minus 1. I am I have to make sure that it is anti uh, skew symmetric yeah. So, if I take the Fafian of this matrix this is an even skew symmetric matrix if I take the Fafian of this I get 2 which is exactly the number of matchings of a 4 cycle perfect matchings of a 4 cycle. But if I take this one I get 0 so that is wrong. So, there is one way of choosing signs which gives you the right answer and one way which does not give you the right answer. So, there is a theorem. So, the result resol the resolution of this is this theorem of Kassel line whom I mentioned earlier. So, if G is a planar graph with 2 n vertices. So, a planar graph is a graph that can be embedded on the plane without any crossings. If it is a if G is a planar graph with 2 n vertices there exists a choice of signs. He the theorem says that you can always find a choice of signs such that the corresponding skew symmetric matrix which you call M whose Fafian is exactly the number of Fafian matrix ok. So, if you notice all the examples that I have given the square the rectangle the aspect diamond the hexagon these are all planar objects right. Everything goes to hell if you take something three dimensional something which cannot be embedded in the plane. For example, if you take the cube you are in trouble. So, plane partitions that is why is not the right way of thinking about it for this question. It is better to think about it as a lozenge tag because that is a planar object yeah. So, once you have this then it is a matter of using techniques from linear algebra. So, Castellane also did the 2 n by uh, 2 m by 2 n rectangle right. And so, it was in the same paper where he did this computation ok and he gave that explicit formula. Okay, so thank you. And I have one more question at the end, uh, which is: You remember we had done the trivial example of the one by n rectangle. Uh, Here is the prize question: two by n rectangles.
Okay, maybe since we have four minutes, maybe you can think about it uh, for two minutes or so. It's a non-trivial answer, but it's a number that you have seen before. Huh? Eight? Two by n. Is it eight here? Yeah, it's eight here, that's right. How do you do this? It's an elementary argument, but it's, but the answer is extremely nice and it's something you have seen before. So don't bother using that complicated formula from it in terms of cosine squares. That's not going to help. Okay, maybe it's, should I just say it? Is anybody getting, getting anywhere? Yes. That's not going to help because there are many ways to change it and uh, if n is very large that will be a mess because you have several locations to change, right, but you can't change everything because if I, okay, good. So let me stress why that does not work. So if I have this, I can change this at a time, I can change this at a time, but I cannot change both this and this at a time at the same time. However, if I have the 4 by 4, I can change this one time, I can change this one time and I can change them both. So, you should be very careful in making such a call. Yes? No, 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 no. It's a very nice formula. It's a number you have seen before. The answer should be something n, something of n with, and that something is something you have seen before in school no less. Okay, I have given several hints. Should I give more hints? Is anybody getting anywhere? Should I give more hints? Okay, I think I have them. Yes? Very good. So, what is the recursion? What is, okay. Yes? Yes? Okay, so you are almost there, so let me give the answer since we are running short on time. So, let us see what, so the key idea here is related to what you are saying. Look at this cell. This cell has to be tiled by a domino, right? There has to be a domino. There are two possibilities. What is it? So, let me call this number a n, the number of tilings of this we will call a n. Now, if it is tiled by a vertical domino, right, if, if it is tiled this way, then this is a n minus 1, right, the remaining can be tiled by a n minus 1, this is the recursive argument, right, but if not, what is going to happen, so let me draw it again, I, I do not know if the thing is the same, but you the same, the idea is important. So, here suppose, so there are only two possibilities for this to be tiled. If it is tiled by vertical domino, we have, we have a recursive expression. If it is tiled by a horizontal domino, then what happens? That is right. This is forced now, right? This is forced. So, this is a n minus 2. So, we have a n is a n minus 1 plus a n minus 2. Does this remind you of something? Fibonacci, yeah. So the answer is the Fibonacci number. So, so a n is actually f of n plus one, where f zero, the convention is f zero is zero, f one is one. Okay. So, so this is so this is a very nice. So you have so everything that I said was true, right? You have heard this in school. You have heard of the Fibonacci numbers in school. So it wasn't an unfair question. Okay. All right. Okay. So thank you.
thanks a lot sir and uh, so uh, so couple of announcements so we are uh, distributing the uh, feedback form now so just wait for 2 minutes and uh,